so we will start this afternoon session that will have three talks with the talk of Nicolas Buffy on flows and diffusions. Awesome. Many thanks, Mary Lou. And thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I had a great time here last year, so I was really excited to be able to come back. Um, so today I'll tell you about two kind of parallel threads of my recent research. Uh, the first is concerned with high-dimensional scientific computing problems, and in particular, solving PDEs in high dimension, namely the many-body Fokker-Planck equation that arises in statistical physics. And the second is in the area of generative modeling, where I've been working with some collaborators to introduce and develop this algorithm known as stochastic interpolants. So on the left here, I'm showing you a depiction a spa of a spatial decomposition of the entropy production rate for an active matter system. And on the right, I'm showing you some example images generated using our stochastic interpolant algorithm. What, while these two application domains at first seem kind of completely unrelated, what I'll show you over the course of this talk is that the underlying mathematical structure is the same, and we can actually use insights from generative modeling to develop algorithms to solve the many-body Fokker-Planck equation and compute entropy production rates like I'm showing on the left, but we can also use insights from the analysis of high-dimensional PDEs to design new algorithms for generative modeling. Okay, so if there's one thing that you take away from this talk, it's that I hope to communicate that there's many interesting high-dimensional mathematical problems that we simply cannot solve using the standard techniques of numerical analysis, but which we may be able to solve using machine learning. And I think personally that this really represents a paradigm shift in computational mathematics, and that there's many interesting problems that would have been completely impossible just a few years ago that we can now solve. Okay, so let's jump right in to this first class of problems in high-dimensional PDEs. To get some insight for what I mean by a high-dimensional PDE, let's kind of contrast this situation with what is perhaps the canonical low-dimensional PDE in applied math, which is the Navier-Stokes equations of fluid dynamics. So for Navier-Stokes, I have an equation for the fluid velocity field coupled to the fluid pressure field, subject perhaps to some incompressibility constraint. And this is posed over a physical two- or three-dimensional space. So solving this equation amounts to estimation of these two d-dimensional fields, the velocity and the pressure field. Because d is small, two or three, there's many algorithms that work amazingly well, but they all kind of proceed via some kind of spatial discretization, like finite differences and finite elements, if anyone here is familiar with those. So again, these are kind of amazing methods that work incredibly well, and we have many like, rigorous error analyses for these methods. But anyone who's worked with these equations knows that going from two dimensions to three dimensions is already a significant computational undertaking. And going beyond three is typically impossible. Four is sort of intractable, maybe can work on the best supercomputers in the world. Five already is too much. You can't solve these equations. But one does not have to look very hard to find equations that are naturally posed over much higher dimensional spaces. I'll focus on one such equation in this talk, which is the Fokker-Planck equation of statistical physics. If you're not familiar, you can think of this as being kind of the fundamental equation of statistical physics, kind of like the Schrodinger equation for quantum mechanics. The situation I want to study in this talk is an interacting particle system. So I have capital N particles, each of which has d-bar internal coordinates, and I'm going to assume they evolve according to some known stochastic dynamics. So here, RT is my total system state, consisting of all the particles concatenated together, BT is some known drift, and then there's some noise term with a diffusion tensor DT. I'm showing you an example of such a system at the bottom here. This is five particles interacting in two dimensions, and I'm showing like a time lapse kind of fading into the background so you can get some intuition for what a trajectory of this system looks like. Here, because I have five particles, each of which has two spatial coordinates, this is a 10-dimensional SDE. Okay, if I now ask what is the probability that this system is in a given state at a given time, that probability density function evolves according to a Fokker-Planck equation. This guy is very easy to write down. I've done it here. This is completely general. But solving this equation requires estimation of an nd bar dimensional density. So even for this very simple toy system, this is a 10-dimensional equation, and you simply cannot solve it using standard techniques of numerical analysis. It's totally hopeless. So if you want to solve an equation like this, you need to do something fundamentally different. So what are the challenges associated with, it, with this? Well, the first one is the cursive dimensionality, which I've kind of focused on so far. How can we possibly hope to estimate rho t in high dimension? Well, this is a talk on high-dimensional computation, so I think we all know the answer to that. We're going to use machine learning, because at this point, we have a lot of empirical and theoretical evidence that machine learning can work well for high-dimensional systems. A second challenge that's kind of unique to the Fokker-Planck equation is that I need to compute a probability density function. So this PDF needs to be normalized. But for truly high-dimensional systems, I can't even compute this integral. The solution to this problem will come from the area of generative modeling, where we'll use a so-called flow-based parameterization that will sort of enforce the normalization automatically. So I don't have to worry about computing this integral. A third challenge for the interacting particle systems that I want to study is that the particles are indistinguishable. They all have the same underlying dynamics, and that means that the solution to the Fokker-Planck equation has permutation symmetry. 
So if I'm going to use a neural network to represent this density, for example, I somehow need to build this permutation symmetry into my architecture because there's n factorial permutations on n particles. And this means if there's a single mode in the density, there'll be n factorial modes. And so if this isn't built into my architecture, I somehow need data from all the modes, which is never going to happen. And last, this is sort of a philosophical question for high dimensional computation in general. Let's say an oracle came down and gave me the solution to this equation. What do I actually want to do with it? Right? This is very different from computing, say, a two-dimensional fluid flow. I can't visualize this thing. I can't plot it. It's really not clear at all that it's even meaningful to us as humans. And this problem is kind of compounded by the fact that I'm studying a system from statistical physics, so I already have the SDE, which means I can already generate samples from rho t and compute expectation values. And many things we care about are actually of the form of expectation values. So whatever I get out of solving this equation, I better get something that has some kind of low-dimensional interpretable output, and it needs to be some kind of physical quantity that we really care about. So let's focus on point four. One answer to this question will come in the area of active matter physics, although I believe there are many other such applications. So what is active matter? For anyone not familiar, active matter studies assemblies of interacting particles. These are often living particles that consume some kind of internal source of energy to drive a self-propelled motion. So for example, I'm an active particle because I can choose to move in a given direction. This is very different from the particles in the gas in this room, which can't you know, spontaneously decide to move in another direction. Why are these systems interesting? Well, they're not described by standard equilibrium statistical physics, so we need new physical and mathematical tools to understand their dynamics. And as a result of this, they often exhibit emergent collective behavior that has no equilibrium counterpart, which ranges from being practically useful to fundamentally interesting. Here's three examples on the left. In the top left, I'm showing you a picture of a starling murmuration. Starlings are flocks of birds that migrate over large distances, and they're known to kind of exhibit this remarkable pattern formation in their density. In the middle, I'm showing you a biofilm for E. coli bacteria. Here we have the spontaneous emergence of a highly non-uniform density from an initially uniform one. And this really only happens because the E. coli are active, because they can kind of propel themselves in a given direction. This is a system that we'll focus on a lot in this talk. And at the bottom, this is kind of for fun, this is a drone image of a herd of sheep kind of migrating across a plane. And if you watch a video of this, there's many on YouTube, you see that they kind of flow like a fluid and they exhibit this kind of remarkable polar ordering. Okay, so there's sort of universal behavior that exists across scales. And all of this is somehow fundamentally brought about by the fact that the individual constituents are active. So why do we care about these systems and what do we want to understand about these systems? Well, a fundamental question that has emerged in recent years is when and where are active systems truly out of equilibrium? So for example, taking this biofilm as kind of some, something to run with, you could imagine asking, now that this has settled down and it has formed into this biofilm, is it really like an equilibrium system in disguise? Can I use equilibrium stat mech to understand it? Or is there something fundamentally different happening here that, that tells me that I need new physical tools to understand? So we would like to be able to say whether or not it's an equilibrium system in disguise or if it's a fundamentally new kind of system. There's two quantities that have emerged in the literature to answer this question. The first is called the system entropy production rate. This is an information theoretic quantity. I look at the Shannon entropy of the solution to the Fokker-Planck equation, and I take its time derivative along the Fokker-Planck dynamics. And the second quantity, it's a little bit more complicated, it's called the total entropy production rate. What I do is the following. I take a look at the path measure, pt, over a horizon t for that stochastic differential equation. Then I define a so-called reverse time path measure, where I basically take a movie of the system's dynamics, and I play that movie backwards. And then I ask, what is the probability of observing this backwards trajectory under the forward time dynamics? I can quantify the difference in probabilities of observing a forward time trajectory versus a backwards time trajectory by taking the KL divergence between these two path measures. This might scale with the horizon t, so I divide by t, and I take the limit as t goes to infinity. Okay, so this quantity here quantifies the breakdown of time reversal symmetry, and I will take as my definition of a non-equilibrium system as this total entropy production rate being non-zero. Okay, and it's obviously positive because there's a KL divergence. So these are two numbers that have obtained kind of fundamental importance in active matter in recent years, but actually, there's no way to compute them from first principles because they both depend on the solution to the Fokker-Planck equation. And in general, I have no way to access that solution unless I'm studying some kind of very simple system where I can compute the solution analytically. All right, so now let's kind of fix a specific system we want to study. What we're going to study is really a phenomenon known as motility-induced phase separation. I'm gonna play a movie of the dynamics here. 
I think it lags a little bit over Zoom, but you can get the general picture. So there's kind of a solid phase in the middle, and then it's surrounded by this active gas. Okay? So this maybe doesn't look so different from things we've seen in equilibrium physics. I mean, it kind of just looks like, like a solid. But if we introduce a model of the dynamics, we can very quickly understand why this is fundamentally interesting. So here's a model. Actually, there's many models that exhibit motility-induced phase separation. Here's one. It's a so-called system of active ornstein uhlenbeck particles. Every particle has a position xi, say in 2D, and an orientation gi, also in 2D. Every particle interacts with every other particle in a purely repulsive way. So they interact only if they're on top of each other. It's a very local force. They really have to be touching, and then they repel one another. And in the absence of these, attractive, or in the absence of these repulsive interactions, every particle wants to swim in the direction gi with velocity v0. And that's the term that really breaks time reversal symmetry. Okay, that's the active term. Then there's some thermal noise. And then the orientation of every particle just evolves according to a simple linear system known as an ornstein uhlenbeck process. There's a time scale here, gamma, which is very, very small. And it just makes it so that each particle kind of points in a fixed direction for a while before changing to another direction. So now, why is this system interesting? Well, you realize that there's no attractive interactions in this system. And in fact, we only ever see liquids and solids in equilibrium physics if the particles are actually attracted to one another. What happens here is something fundamentally new. And it's kind of akin to just a giant traffic jam. Basically, two particles ram into each other. They kind of slow down. Another one comes in, starts to sort of nucleate a droplet. And then at some point, you have a bunch of guys that are sort of trapped inside. They would really like to get out, but they can't. The only ones that can leave are on the boundary. But the guys that are leaving on the boundary are getting replaced by guys coming in from the gas. Okay, and if you turn off this self-propulsion term, like if you set V0 equal to 0, this will not be stable. So it's a fundamentally non-equilibrium phase transition. And what we would like to do is somehow compute a spatial decomposition of the entropy production rate, like we saw on the first slide, to understand where this system is actually out of equilibrium. Okay, now to just convince ourselves that this is a hard problem, we can count dimension. So on the right here, I have 32,000 particles. Every particle has four internal coordinates for the two positions, the two orientation coordinates. And so this is roughly a 130,000 dimensional Fokker Planck equation. Okay, so how on earth can I solve a PDE in 130,000 dimensions? Well, let's take some insight from generative modeling, namely diffusion models, and let's first observe that for any density rho, I can write its gradient as grad log rho, which is also known as the score, times rho. Okay, this is a very simple identity. It just follows because grad log rho is grad rho over rho, and then the division cancels with the multiplication. What this lets me do is rewrite my Fokker-Planck equation as a continuity equation. I can take the diffusion term that appeared on the right-hand side and just stick it inside the drift, where now I've defined a new velocity field vt, which is just bt minus dt grad log rho t. Okay, so the first insight at this stage is that grad log rho does not require normalization. So if I somehow formulate an algorithm that only requires estimation of the score, then I've avoided the need to compute this normalization integral that I said at the beginning was very hard. Okay, so now why is this representation actually useful? Well, I have a way to solve continuity equations in sort of arbitrary dimension. It's known as the method of characteristics. So what are the characteristics? Well, the characteristics are a system of ordinary differential equations that evolve according to the velocity field on the right-hand side of this continuity equation. If I look at the characteristics, they obey something that's called the probability flow equation in the generative modeling literature. And this equation has a remarkable property, which is that if I take an initial condition from row zero, as a sample from row zero, and I solve this equation up to time t, then the state of this ODE at time t will be distributed according to rho t. What that means is that the flow map of this equation is a transport map from the initial condition to the Fokker-Planck equation row zero onto the solution rho t at time t. So here's a graphical illustration of what I'm saying. I have some initial condition row zero, and if I take samples from row zero and evolve them according to my velocity field v, they'll end up somewhere else at a later time but where they end up will be precisely distributed according to rho t. Then there's kind of an Eulerian frame of reference which says that the flow map rt pushes rho zero right onto rho t. This is useful for me because I can ask what is the change of variables from rho zero onto rho t, and it actually obeys a very simple formula which gives me eva exact evaluation of rho t. I can say that rho t evaluated in a Lagrangian frame that moves with the flow of probability is equal to the initial condition times this exponential factor, which is just a line integral of the divergence of v. So if I have access to grad log rho, then I can compute this line integral, and then I can evaluate the solution to the Fokker-Planck equation. OK, so now let's get some intuition. For, yeah. How do you compute the Lagrangian? How do I compute what? 
So I don't need to compute capital R, right? Capital R is the flow map. I can always, I can always just solve this differential equation, right? So I draw lowercase r as an initial condition from row zero. It's in very high dimension, but it's just an ODE. But that's easy, right, because th I can just time step this thing. Yeah. OK. So to get some intuition for this new frame of reference, uh, let's look at two particles in 1D on the torus. OK, that's a four-dimensional system. But if I look at the differences in their coordinates, it turns out I get a closed system of equations that's now in 2D. And so I can visualize everything and get some intuition. OK, so first of all, if I simulate this thing for a long time, it turns out that it tends to a stationary density. And I can just bin this thing, because it's in 2D, and we can visualize it here. So here's my stationary density in phase space of x and g. And there's two modes. These two modes just correspond to basically what's kind of like a MIP on the torus between these two particles. Just the two guys kind of stuck on top of one another. Now I can ask, how is this stationary density built up by individual deterministic or stochastic trajectories? That's what I'm showing on the right here. So the top figure on the right corresponds to trajectories from this SDE listed on the left. OK, they're not super interpretable because they're trajectories of an SDE. Right? They kind of bounce all over the place. You can see that maybe it looks reasonable that their stationary density would be given by this histogram on the left because they kind of spend some time dwelling in the modes and they transition between them. But otherwise, it's not totally clear what's going on. If you look at a phase portrait of the probability flow, by contrast, what you see is something very, very simple, which is that the dynamics just correspond to these closed limit cycles in the clockwise direction. Okay? So in addition to giving access, to evaluation of the solution to the Fokker-Planck equation, somehow the probability flow averages over the stochastic dynamics in a manner that's consistent with the global statistics, but gives much more interpretable trajectories. Now, what about the EPRs? Well, I said that the system EPR, which is the time derivative of the Shannon entropy, and now I have an evaluation, a formula that lets me evaluate rho t. So I can just plug that in directly to the system EPR, and I get a very simple expression, which is that the system EPR is just the expected divergence of the velocity field. So if I have v, I can compute the system EPR. Now, this is a single number. And I said at the beginning what I want is somehow like a spatial decomposition of the EPR. So this doesn't give me that. But I can go one step further, and I can define a microscopic stochastic system EPR, which is just the argument of this expectation. And this is now a function defined over phase space. So I'm visualizing this on the right for my low dimensional system. Remember that the dynamics correspond to these closed limit cycles. So what you see is that there's entropy production when the particles collide, and there's entropy consumption when the particles leave one another. So somehow this system EPR is kind of highlighting that there's something very fundamental happening at the interaction between the particles. Now even this kind of stochastic system EPR is still sort of problematic for me because it's defined over a high dimensional phase space. I can visualize it for this two-dimensional system, but for my 130,000-dimensional system, I still can't visualize it. But one can recognize that if my system state corresponds to individual stacked particles, this divergence actually splits into a sum over the individual particles. So now I can take as my definition for the contribution of the ith particle to the EPR to just be this lower dimensional divergence. And then I can color all the particles in a, in a high dimensional system by their contribution. And that gives me my spatial decomposition. I'll skip some of the details because the total EPR is more technical. But one can play the same game for the total EPR. And you again find that it is given just by a very simple formula in terms of the velocity field. And the stochastic total EPR ends up being just the squared velocity weighted by the inverse diffusion tensor. And by simple properties of squared L2 norms, this also splits into a sum over individual particle contributions. OK, so now what about learning? So far, everything has been kind of analytical, assuming that I have access to v. But of course, I don't have access to v. I, I need grad log rho to get access to v. Well, we can take insight from generative modeling. Namely, we can use a, a procedure known as score matching, developed by Hibernian in this 2005 JMLR paper. For any density rho, you, can, you should think of this as being the stationary density for the Fokker-Planck equation, but it's true for any rho. I can always define a so-called score matching loss for a parametric model h hat theta. Take it to be your favorite neural network which is just the weighted L2 error between h hat theta and grad log rho. This is a very nice loss function. It's strongly convex in h hat. It has kind of all the properties that one would want. But it's actually not usable because I don't have observations of grad log rho. I don't have any data. So I can't actually minimize this thing. But it's a very simple derivation. If you just expand and integrate by parts, this ends up being equivalent to an implicit but tractable loss known as the score matching loss, where I just need to be able to take the divergence of my model with respect to its input. But I can do this using standard automatic differentiation packages. Okay, 
So now, if I have a data set of examples from my system, which I can always obtain just by simulating the SDE, then I can approximate this loss function via Monte Carlo, just as an empirical sum. And now I have something that I can minimize over the parameters of a neural network, for example. There's something interesting about this loss as written, however, which is that it only involves squared L2 norms and divergences. We already observed that for interacting particle systems, both of these things split into sums over the particle contributions. So I can, in fact, write this as a sum over particle contributions, where there's a new quantity that appears here, h hat j, which is my model for the score of the jth particle. Okay, this second line suggests that perhaps we shouldn't think of snapshots of the system state as the data, but because the particles are indistinguishable, we should actually think of each individual particle as being the data. Okay? And then we should parameterize this particle score and kind of batch over the particles rather than batching over the snapshots. To get some physical insight for what I'm saying, the first line here says that this entire picture is one sample. The second line says that every black dot in the picture is one sample. And in fact, by physical locality, we would expect that if I want the entropy production for a given particle, it really should only depend somehow on nearby particles. It shouldn't be this like kind of highly non-local thing. And that means I can actually parameterize my neural network in such a way that h hat j only depends on the local neighborhood. Okay? We actually developed a new kind of transformer neural network architecture that does precisely this. It takes as input a given particle coordinate in a local neighborhood of particles. And this is sort of very well adapted to this problem because transformers are actually permutation equivariant with respect to their tokens. So if we view the particles as being tokens, then we kind of have the transformer learn higher and higher order interactions between these particles in a permutation equivariant way. And it precisely accounts for this permutation symmetry that I introduced at the beginning. I have a slide with more details on that later if anyone is interested, but it can get sort of technical, so I'm going to skip it for now. Okay, so now I want to show you guys some results. So this is a system of 4,096 particles. What I'm going to show you is a movie. On the left is just kind of the system's dynamics uncolored, so you get some intuition for what's going on. In the middle, it's the, the particles colored by their contribution to the total EPR, and on the right, by their contribution to the system EPR. Okay, and what you see is something sort of remarkable. I guess it's less remarkable when it's lagging, but still kind of remarkable, which is that the bold quantities here entirely concentrate on the interface between the faces. Okay, you can see that it's kind of lit up on the interface and not as much in the guess. This was very exciting to us when we obtained this result because there's predictions in the theoretical physics literature, namely these two papers by Nardini and Rowe below, that this is precisely the qualitative structure that entropy production should have in MIPS. But no one has ever been able to compute this because the entropy production definitions are fundamentally high dimensional, so no one had access to them. So they make kind of phenomenological approximations or hydrodynamic approximations that haven't really been verified in the lab, and they get a prediction. But here we can actually just attack the problem directly from its microscopic definition. And I'm really not aware of a way you can compute these quantities without using machine learning due to the underlying high dimensionality. So now you can recognize that because we kind of observed that the system should be physically local and we parameterize in terms of local neighborhoods, our neural network actually doesn't know about the total system size. And what this means is that if I train at one system size, you might expect that the neural network would actually extrapolate to higher dimensional systems and still make reasonable predictions. So what I'm showing you here are results for a neural network trained with 4,096 particles. And then I'm just taking that same neural network without any additional learning and just extending it to higher and higher dimensional systems, going all the way up to this 32,000 particle system. And what you see is something very complementary, which is that as the particle count increases, the cluster gets more and more stable, and the interfacial signal kind of sharpens. You can play the same game, varying other parameters of the phase diagram, for example, the packing fraction. So the packing fraction here is basically the size of the box, how, how, dense, you know, how densely packed the particles are. What I did was train with phi is 0.5 on 4,096 particles. Here I'm showing plots for 8,192 particles with different values of the packing fraction. And what we see is that the network makes predictions that are physically reasonable in every case. For very low packing fraction, there's essentially no interactions between the particles and there's no EPR. As you increase it, they start to interact more and more and you get sporadic EPR throughout the gas. As you increase it further, a cluster forms and you get this interfacial signal that we saw before. And then when you increase it enough, the situation inverts and you actually have a solid with a bubble of gas inside of it. And again, it concentrates on the interface. Now finally, here is just kind of a movie, again, of the 32,000 particle system, but now colored by the two definitions of the EPR. 
again with a network that was only trained on 4,096 particles. And you see something kind of remarkable that it makes a very stable prediction over long times, despite the fact that it never saw a system of, of this dimensionality during training. Okay, so everything so far has been about how we can use insights from generative modeling, namely estimations of scores, which appear in the context of diffusion models, to compute high dimensional quantities in active matter physics. What I want to show now is how we can use insights from the Fokker-Planck equation and high dimensional PDEs to develop new algorithms for generative modeling. So what is the generative modeling problem? Well, I think this entire session will be about generative modeling, but let's just kind of set the scene. So I'm going to assume that I'm given samples, xi, going from 1 to n, from a target distribution that I will call rho 1. And my goal is to, to form an estimate, rho hat one, of rho one, that's close in some sense. Pick your, pick your favorite distance metric, KL, Wasserstein, whatever. I want it to be small. And then I want to draw some new samples from rho hat one to approximate samples from rho one. Okay, so I'm going to take a theoretical approach that's very similar to what we saw so far, which is that I want to build an ODE or an SDE such that if I draw an initial condition from some simple base distribution rho zero, then the state of my system will be a sample from rho one at time one. And the name of the game, then, is how do I actually design the drift entering this SDE such that it accomplishes this task? Moreover, what I want to do, then, is approximate this ODE or SDE with some kind of learning algorithm. And then I'll take, as rho hat 1, the law of the state of my approximate system at time 1. So implicit here is that not only do I need to design this drift field B, but I need to design it in a way that is variationally tractable, in the sense that there's some loss function that I can easily minimize. So there's been amazing progress in this area in recent years, and particularly with this kind of formulation, mainly with the advent of diffusion models by Yang Song and Jonathan Ho and others. So let me give a quick overview on diffusion models. So the basic idea is as follows. I take some sample from my target distribution, like this picture of this dog here, and I pass it through a very simple stochastic process like an ornstein uhlenbeck process. On infinite time, this process converts the picture of the dog into pure Gaussian noise. It becomes a sample from N01. Now I can ask, is there a process that reverses this? In other words, which takes Gaussian noise and maps it back to pictures of dogs. And it turns out there is. This was proven by Brian Anderson in 1982. And this reverse time stochastic process depends on the score. So if I can learn the score, as I was doing for active matter, then I can somehow draw new samples, new images. So this is an amazing algorithm. And it's really hard to understate the impact that it's had in recent years. But as formulated, there's maybe a few drawbacks that one would like to avoid. So first of all, this thing converges on infinite time. But in practice, we can't run it until infinite time. So we have to pick some finite time. And that introduces a bias, because it hasn't actually converged to the base distribution yet. Second, it is very hard to change this formulation so that this thing converges to anything other than a Gaussian. And in some applications, you might want to have more freedom in your base density so that you can somehow tailor your base density to the, to the problem that you're trying to solve. And last. Somehow we think of this process as having a forward noising process and a reverse time denoising process. Like somehow the, the noising and the denoising are intimately coupled. And you can either go forward or go backward. What I want to show you now is that by viewing this problem from kind of the language of high dimensional PDEs, we can eliminate all of these restrictions. We can formulate generative models that converge exactly on finite time. We can formulate generative models that have an arbitrary base distribution. And we can completely decouple the noising from the denoising and just think about forming a connection in the space of measures and then asking, how do we actually sample that connection? And there'll be significant flexibility in terms of how we do that. So how can we do this? Well, I'll introduce an object that we call a stochastic interpolant. So a stochastic interpolant is the following stochastic process. Xt is my interpolant. I take a linear combination of x0, x1, and z, where x0 is a random draw from my base distribution rho 0, which can be arbitrary. X1 is a draw from the target. It's like an image. And Z is just some standard normal. And this linear combination needs to satisfy some boundary conditions, namely alpha starts at 1 and ends at 0, beta starts at 0 and ends at 1, and gamma starts at 0 and ends at 0. So as an example, you can take alpha is 1 minus t, beta is t, and gamma is square root t times 1 minus t. This guy comes from the Brownian bridge, for anyone who recognizes that. So what are the key properties? Well, it satisfies the right boundary conditions. At time t is equal to 0, it's a sample from rho 0. At time t is equal to 1, it's a sample from rho 1. It's easy to sample, given samples from rho 0 and rho 1. I just compute this guy explicitly. And the base distribution here is arbitrary and can be tailored to rho 1. There's nothing that makes it a Gaussian. Okay? So let's visualize this at the sample level for a few different examples. 
So in my top row here, I'm taking my base distribution to be, say, white flowers and the target to be purple flowers. And I'm visualizing this example that I gave at the left. You see that the white flower is kind of smoothly converted into the purple flower with a bit of noise in the middle. In my middle row here, I've changed the definition of the interpolant, but I've kept the same base and target densities. So the white flower devolves into pure noise in the middle, and then the purple flower emerges from the noise. And finally, I'm showing you something that just has, a, say, a target distribution, which is a Gaussian, and a base distribution, which is white flowers. It's a bit like score-based diffusion, just on a finite time interval. Okay? Now, this is what happens at the level of the samples. But one could also ask what happens at the level of the density. Okay, we've seen that xt moves from a sample from row 0 to a sample from row 1. So somehow the density of xt should interpolate between row 0 and row 1. And this is precisely what happens. The key realization is that once you specify an interpolant, you actually define a path in the space of measures between row 0 and row 1. So my rows here correspond to different definitions of the interpolant, and my columns correspond to different times. I'm taking my base distribution to be a two-mode Gaussian mixture, and my target distribution to be a three-mode Gaussian mixture. And what you see is that in every case, my two-mode mixture is smoothly converted into a three-mode mixture. As I change the definition of the interpolant, somehow the, the Intermediate dynamics changes, the structure of row t changes, but no matter what, there's kind of a smooth deformation from row 0 to row 1. The key realization here is that this somehow specifies some kind of dynamical transport of measure. And what I want to do now is actually characterize that dynamical transport analytically using the language of high-dimensional PDEs. So here's a theorem, the first theorem of this talk. The time-dependent density, rho tx, of this interpolant xt can be shown to satisfy a transport equation. It's a very simple equation, much like what we saw in the first part of the talk, where the drift here, b, is the conditional expectation of x dot given xt is equal to x. So if I want to know what the drift is at any point in space, what I do is I look at every interpolant that travels through that point, and I average all their time derivatives. But now we already know from the first part of the talk that if I have a transport equation, somehow this is equivalent to a Fokker-Planck equation. And in fact, this is actually equivalent to an infinite family of Fokker-Planck equations. I'm free to add whatever drift I want, as long as, sorry, whatever diffusion term I want, as long as I compensate by adding some score term to the drift. So that's what I've done here for an arbitrary time-dependent scalar diffusion coefficient, epsilon of t. But you can take this to be state-dependent or make it a tensor. It doesn't really change anything at all. And this is valid for any epsilon of t that's non-negative. Okay? At the start, I said that whatever algorithm I formulate, the drifts need to be variationally tractable. And it turns out that, indeed, they are. So one can show, it's a very simple derivation, that this conditional expectation is the unique minimizer of a simple quadratic objective function, where basically you use a model b hat that tries to fit x dot. This just follows directly from the L2 projection characterization of a conditional expectation. And it's not as obvious, but one can also write down a loss function for the score. It's a very similar kind of loss. It's a very simple quadratic objective function. And it really follows by recognizing that the score is related to the conditional expectation of z. Okay? So now I have two loss functions. And these can be approximated over an empirical data set, uh, just like I did in the first part of the talk via Monte Carlo. And then I can minimize them over neural networks to learn a model in practice. So now how do I sample these guys? Well, if I want to sample from the transport equation, I can look at the underlying characteristics. That gives me a probability flow equation. And like we saw before, if I set my initial condition to be a sample from row 0, then the state of this system will be a sample from row 1 at time 1. And for any of my Fokker-Planck equations, I also have an underlying stochastic differential equation that satisfies the same property. If I draw an initial condition from row 1, the state at time 1 will be a sample from row 1. So what I'm saying here, essentially, is that the path in the space of measures is completely decoupled from how we sample it. Okay, this is very unlike the picture in score-based diffusion where you go forward and then you go backwards. What I'm saying is we specify a connection, and then we're free to sample it with whatever level of noise we want, ranging from zero to arbitrarily high. So I'm making this point clear in this image below. My columns correspond to different definitions of the interpolant. As I change the interpolant, I'm changing the structure of the intermediate density. My rows correspond to different choices of the diffusion coefficient. So as I go down in the rows, I actually increase the diffusion coefficient, and I have more noise. And what you see is that the one-time marginals are always preserved. If I look at, say, a cross-section in T for different values of epsilon, it's always the same. I'm just changing how this density is built up by individual deterministic or stochastic trajectories. OK, so you could say, well, if all of these processes are the same, they all have the same intermediate density, then why do I really care? It's kind of a nice theoretical point, but it doesn't seem to really matter that much. 
And that's actually because everything we've been doing so far has been purely analytical. I'm assuming I have access to the true B in the true grad log row. A key realization is that in practice, we have errors because we learn. And these are different processes, and the errors propagate differently to these different processes. So we can characterize this exactly now. So let's consider kind of a learned model where I have an approximate B hat and I have an approximate S hat. And let's just, for simplicity, take a scalar epsilon time independent diffusion coefficient, although all of this can be generalized. Let's let rho hat of Tx be the marginal density of this process. Okay, so this is like my approximate model that I'm going to use to sample. Then one can prove a bound on the KL divergence from the target rho one to my model rho hat one. Okay, this is a very strong guarantee. It says that the KL is upper bounded by a sum of two terms, weighted by one over epsilon and epsilon, respectively. The first term is the error in the drift B, and the second term is the error in the score S hat. Okay, in fact, you realize that up to constants, these are precisely the two terms that we minimize when we learn an interpolant. So what this says is if you learn an interpolant and you sample with an SDE, then you actually maximize the likelihood of your model. This result first appeared in my joint paper with Michael Albergo and Eric van den Einden cited here, but I just want to point out that a very similar result appeared in the score-based diffusion literature in this 2021 NeurIPS paper. However, it's worth recognizing that in the literature, it seems to be the case that it's thought that these kinds of guarantees are sort of unique to the score-based diffusion process. That there's something about score-based diffusion that gives you this guarantee in KL. What I'm saying here is that this is totally independent of the underlying process. It's sort of a basic property of STEs and Fokker-Planck equations. And let me also point out that there's been a lot of work using a guarantee like this for score-based diffusion by Sinho in the audience, Sitan Chen, Holden Lee, and others, who have shown that you can prove strong guarantees for sampling in discrete time by kind of converting this type of KL guarantee into a discrete time guarantee. And the same could be done for interpolants using this kind of result here. Okay, now let's contrast this with the scenario for learning a probability flow equation. So let's take some approximate probability flow where I have some model B hat, and let's take as my approximate density rho hat the push forward under this flow map. Okay, so this just means that I've learned a model and then I sample by solving this ODE. And one can prove an equality for the KL divergence, which says that the KL divergence between the target row one and my model row hat one is given exactly by a product of two terms. It looks very similar to what we saw above. The first term is the error in B, B hat minus B. And the second term is kind of a surprising term. It's grad log row hat minus grad log row. Okay, something very subtle here is that grad log row hat is not our model of the score S hat. Okay, it's the score of our model. It's the score of the push forward distribution that we generate. And in fact, you realize that this term is uncontrolled in general. When you learn an interpolant or a score-based diffusion model, there's absolutely nothing that forces the score of your model to be equal to the score of the target distribution. And so you actually don't get a guarantee in KL when you train a, a deterministic model like this. And in fact, this suggests that SDEs somehow obtain stronger guarantees than ODEs. And when we proved this, we were kind of surprised and we went and looked in the generative modeling literature and we realized that if you look at kind of state-of-the-art results from practitioners, actually they always get better results when they sample with an SDE than when they sample with an ODE. So we wanted to test this ourselves. Uh, so what I'm showing here is a plot. On the x-axis, it's just a fixed diffusion coefficient. And on the y-axis, it's the KL divergence between the target and my model. And I'm showing four curves here. They just correspond to kind of different choices of what you can learn. The four curves don't matter too much. What I want to point out is that each one of these curves is kind of U-shaped, very consistent with the one over epsilon, epsilon trade-off that we saw in the guarantee, and that every single one of them has a minimum at a non-zero value of epsilon. Okay, so that we actually do find better sampling performance when we use an SDE versus when we use an ODE. Admittedly, this is a bit of a synthetic example. I mean, it's in 128 dimensions, so it's non-trivial, but it's a Gaussian mixture. So we recruited an amazing undergraduate, Willis Ma, and also a, a pretty amazing computer vision researcher at NYU, Saining Zia, to see if we could test this at large scale. So here I'm showing results for image generation on ImageNet 256. On the y-axis, I'm showing the FID score. This is kind of a common metric in image generation to judge the quality of the images that your model produces, and lower is better. And on the x-axis, I'm showing the number of function evaluations. It's like how many points you use to discretize the ODE or the SDE. There's four curves here. The green one is an ODE, and the other three are SDEs. And what you see is that for a low number of function evaluations, the ODE performs better. Remember, lower is better. 
This is because it's easier to integrate an ODE than it is to integrate an SDE. This is kind of very well known because the paths of SDEs are much rougher. But on the other hand, if you have the computational budget to push to a higher number of function evaluations, we find that the three SDE curves actually dip below the asymptotic value for the ODE curve, and they all perform better. And in fact, practitioners really care about this gap in FID. This is a pretty significant jump in FID. So what are the key takeaways? Well, first of all, defining the path is completely decoupled from how that path is sampled. And as a result, the sampling procedure can actually be chosen to maximize sample quality after the fact, or to trade off between compute and sample quality. And in fact, there's, there's kind of a significant trade off here between sample quality, which is maximized by SDEs, and speed, which is maximized by ODEs. Okay, and then I'll just kind of conclude with uh, one more little result from this paper by, by Willis and, and Saining that I just mentioned on the previous slide. When we use all these little tricks, the extra flexibility in the base distribution, the extra, extra flexibility in optimizing over the diffusion coefficient after the fact, we actually found that uh, interpolant models were actually able to beat diffusion models in image quality at significant scale, ranging from 33 million parameters to 675 million parameters. And that, so here, SIT is a so-called scalable interpolant transformer. It's a kind of neural network that we can use for interpolants. And DIT is a diffusion transformer. It's a diffusion model that uses the transformer backbone. What we find is that in every case, we obtained lower FID using interpolants, and in fact, that we always found significant benefits by using stochastic sampling rather than deterministic sampling. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you guys very much for listening. So thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, really impressive. Um, I have especially questions to the first part of the talk. Um, why, uh, like, what's your choice of, I mean, you're, at some point you're asking to represent a physical system of many particles and put, and, like, put it into a machine learning model. And, I mean, there's roughly 10 years of research on uh, development of descriptors. Why didn't you use uh, one of the descriptors people have already looked into? So what do you mean by descriptors here? Can you give um, an example of one? Like, I mean, in the field of learning interatomic potentials, mm -hmm. in um, like scaling between DFT and molecular dynamic simulations, mm -hmm. um, the idea is to represent particle states um, as um, permutationally invariant, rotationally invariant, mm -hmm. and so on, and people have developed like nice descriptors that do that. Mm -hmm. And then you can just put that into a fully connected network and you don't need to deal with like all the invariance problems. Mm -hmm. Um, have you considered something like that? Actually, Just we did. Just out of curiosity. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting point. Maybe we could improve performance by doing that. So we went and looked in the computational chemistry community, and we went and looked at kind of computational quantum mechanics as well. Uh, and it seemed that the latest research was kind of using transformer-like architectures, like we end up using ourselves. But we didn't use any kind of descriptors that you're describing. We do okay. make the network translation invariant by you mm -hmm. know, just always looking at differences. And it's also permutation invariant because attention is permutation invariant. Sure. But that's about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for the very, very clean talk. So two questions. So one is at some point you mentioned that now you consider a samples every particle. Mm -hmm. Now, does this mean that the particles are IAD or do you have some sort of ergodicity in the system? No, yeah, I mean, so like, it's sort of intuition that we, we say that the individual particles are, are samples. I mean, it might be better to say if you believe that there's some kind of like fixed radius beyond which the particles don't really interact at the level of the entropy production, then the total number of IID samples is the number of kind of independent local neighborhoods like that. But yeah, there's some kind of correlation. But you don't know if that's true. We, we don't know exactly if that's true. But okay. we did find a significant performance improvement by batching over particles and using this network. That we, yeah, but we can't do any theoretical analysis. Okay. And, okay, the second question is about the very impressive result that you show in the last slide. Um, I'm wondering if, though, the, the comparison is entirely fair in the sense that your method has the same computational complexity as the diffusion one. It does, yeah. Okay. I mean, to some extent, like, the kind of interpolant that we use in this framework is, is really almost a diffusion model, to be completely okay. honest, um, because the base distribution is just a Gaussian. I mean, we're really doing... Um, we're really doing this 
but just for ImageNet 256. I see. So it's a lot like score-based diffusion, just exact on 0, 1. Um, and in fact, this additional flexibility of tuning the diffusion coefficient after the fact, you can also do that in score-based diffusion, because diffusion models are a particular case of an interpolant. Um, but it hadn't really been explored to the same degree that we do in that paper. Thanks. Yeah. Any other pressing question? If not, in the interest of time, I propose that uh, we postpone. And uh, the next talk will be online. So, Francisco, if you hear us. Ah, Francisco had a question, actually. Ah. Uh, so, you can unmute yourself, maybe, Francisco, since you're going to talk anyway. I can't unmute. Okay. <laughs> I exited the Zoom, but I can answer over here or something. Uh, but let me, I mean, I will need to uh, unmute him anyway, because he's giving the next talk. <laughs> Uh, where is it? It's here. Ask to unmute. Can you do it now? Yep, yes. I can do it now. Yeah. Yes, you can. can please. You yeah, can, do you want to ask your question to Nick? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so at some point in one of the slides, there was a likelihood control term. Mm -hmm. um, like, you wrote me either. So, like, my question was, like, I mean, just I saw it very briefly, but it looks like this is the type of, like, result that you get you can apply something like data processing, then followed by Grassanoff theorem, and then you decouple two terms usually. So it, it, this result is like you mentioned, like it's in one of the Chen papers, um, but it's quite common across like a lot of sampling of SDE papers too, these types of, of, of control theorems. And is there anything more specific about this one in particular? No, it's um, very related to all some... those. And I think, in, in fact, it, it sort of came out at the same time as many of the results that, that you're quoting. We don't actually go through Gersonov and then use data processing. You can derive it directly from a PDE argument on the Fokker-Planck equation. And in fact, if you do this, then you find kind of precisely what you lose when you go to data processing, because you start with an equality. And it's really the same equality that I use to prove the kind of likelihood equality for an ODE. Um, so it's maybe a slightly different way to prove something that's very similar to the other results that you're quoting. Uh, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So let's thanks Nink again.